Good morning, everyone. Let's sing this hymn together. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the works thy hand hath made I see the stars I see the stars I hear the mighty thunder Thy power throughout the universe display Come on church then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. God, His Son not sparing, send Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died, to take away my sin, our sin, and sings my soul, Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Shouts of acclamation And take us home What joy shall fill our hearts Then we shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art Then sings my soul Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art.
where you are. to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. Lord, we praise you, hear our faith. Oh, there is a sound, there is a sound. I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As He walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear worship He hears faith Lord, we worship You Lord, we worship You oh, oh, oh. Wake my soul and sing sing his praise aloud sing his praise aloud wake my soul awake my soul and sing sing his praise aloud sing his praise aloud That changes things The sound of His people on their knees oh, Wake up, you slumbering It's time to worship Him Awake oh, my soul and sing Sing His praise aloud Sing His praise to Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Deliverer, the Rescuer, the Comforter, the Healer, the Friend of Sinners. 
through your spirit, Jesus, move as we praise and sing worship to you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Lift my voice to sing of your goodness. Lift my voice to sing of your love. Lift my voice to sing hallelujah. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. I lift my hands because I'm forgiven. Lift my hands because I'm set free. Lift my hands as a sign of surrender. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. Maybe just where you are. If you can, maybe just stretch out your hands as a sign, a symbolic act of surrender this morning as we sing this, recalling his faithfulness towards us, his blood shed on the cross that forgives our sin and iniquities. We are free people because of Jesus. Lift my hands because I'm forgiven. I lift my hands because I'm set free. I lift my hands as a sign of surrender. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. We give you the highest my eyes I'll know your return and you will reign forever in glory you will reign in glory forever yes you will reign in glory forever Jesus I say
our Savior, you're worthy of it all. words on your tongue that you just want to speak out to Jesus in this moment. You might have thanksgiving in your heart this morning. For your family, for your finances, for your home, for those you love, for your job. Or it might just simply be thankfulness for God's presence with you. You utter those words to him. You might want to do that in a tongue in another language. You might want to do that in English. sense when we were praying that some of us this morning um, have heard God's voice in the secret place in lockdown, that God has said things to us, um, things about our vocation, our purpose, our sense of direction, what you were made to do to be, that God has uttered things to you in um, the desert maybe of lockdown. Um, but over these past few weeks, you've sort of dampened it down. You've sort of said, oh, no, that, I'll just forget about that. Now things are going back to a bit more of normal. Um, I'll just forget that. But I, we just really sense that God wants to stoke the fire in you this morning. For whatever that thing is, whatever that people group is, whatever that place is, whatever that job is, whatever it is, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would stoke the fire again. Lord, for the words that you have spoken, would they come to pass? God, we believe that you fulfill your promises. And Lord, you are the one that opens doors. So we surrender, God, to your word over our lives this morning. We receive your promise. We receive your word. God, we pray with surrendered hearts, God, we pray that you would open the doors. Come, Holy Spirit. Just allow him to confirm those words in your heart. Just give him just a few minutes just to, to breathe on you again. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, I had the almost the picture just as Joe was praying of that, that there were things that had, um, it's a picture of a garden and then there had been something beautiful placed in the garden, but it had been covered in leaves that had fallen from a tree and something had just been forgotten. And God just came with a leaf blower. And I just feel like he just wants to remind people, he just to, wants to recover. Maybe something that he whispered at the start of lockdown in the secret place and he just wants to uncover it again now. So we pray, Holy Spirit, you are the one that calls us to remember. Oh God, we struggle so hard to remember without you. But you call us and you help us to remember everything you have spoken to us. So we pray, Holy Spirit, for those among us that you would call us out, call us to remember all you've spoken. Recover what has been lost. Let no word you have spoken be wasted. And Lord, we we also turn our gaze outward and we think of our city. And we think of the young people of our city who have been getting results over the, the last week and over the course of this summer. And all the uncertainty, 
all of the excitement that is attached with that. And God, I pray that you would take each one of these young people and that they would be like an arrow in your hand, that they would be fired in the direction that you want them to be fired in. And God, I pray even now that you would be intercepting courses where you have a different plan, where God, you want to call people up and out where you want to draw people towards a greater vocation than perhaps what they'd even thought possible of themselves. That God, you would captivate their hearts. That God, you would call them forward. And God, we think of our world. Lord, we remember the nations of our world where we can look and think, oh God, where are your purposes? Where is your justice? Where is your goodness? And God, we pray now that God, you would bring people out to birth your justice in the nations. That Lord, you are the father to the fatherless. You set the orphans in families. God, you alone are just. You alone are good. And we pray, Holy Spirit, over all the situations, and you might just want to call some of them to mind. Beirut. The immigrant crisis. Wars in countries that are dear to your heart. And we just pray now, Lord. Lord, would you set the, the lonely in families? Would you bring peace? Would you bring justice? In Jesus' name. And why don't we draw all of our prayers together by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. 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 I don't know if it's, um, I wasn't planning on saying this, but just as John was um, praying there, I was just really vividly reminded of um, a moment in my life um, when I was, uh, what would I have been, 18, and um, I was all set to go to university um, in a place that I loved and was really excited about. I was going to be near the sea and it was going to be amazing. I was going to have an adventure. And um, the month before I was meant to go, um, the course that I was meant to be doing just shut down, the whole department shut down and moved to a different university and that university I didn't want to go to. And I had no plan, I had no money, I didn't have um, any idea what God wanted me to do. Um, and I wasn't even sure at in that point in my life um, whether God had a plan for my life. I was a bit all over the place. Um, but God just um, intercepted that arrow as John was praying um, of my life and set me on a completely different trajectory. Um, I ended up moving to Sheffield to do a gap year and honestly that that year um, completely changed um, the direction of my life and I am so grateful. I often pray the prayer of thank thankfulness for that um, interception of God. So I don't know if that applies to anyone right now that you may have gotten some news this week that has just thrown a spanner in the works and you have no idea where you're heading, um, but be encouraged that um, God knows what he's doing and he has, um, his kindness is on your life. And if you let him, he will lead you to better places and places that you um, could not even have dreamt of. I never expect, expected to be in Nottingham um, at this point in my life, but I'm so glad I am. So be encouraged. Um, and yeah, we, oh, God is just so good, isn't he? He's so he good. He really is. <laughs> he really is. So, because if, that, if you had never done that, if you'd have never changed, you would have never met John me. always goes. Never He's, met me. You would have never met John. So there you go. It's worth it, guys. <laughs> Not just for that, <laughs> but for that, definitely. 
So, welcome. Um, I don't know what you've heard because we've had some tech glitches, but you are so welcome. We are Trinity, you are Trinity, um, virtually we are together, and it's great to be together this morning. We, um, we have a vision at Trinity to see the church on fire and the city alive. And the church on fire simply means we want to encounter Jesus. We want to become like him as we are with him in his presence we want our lives to become more like his life and our lives to be um, filled with his life and um, as we do that as we become like him we're able to do the things that he did we're filled with his power and we're sent out to be his hands and feet on the earth and that's what the city alive bit is about it's an overflow of the first bit so church on fire city alive you are those things wherever you are as trinity church nottingham yeah, and it's, uh, if you, that excites you and if you're a part of Trinity or if you are not, maybe you are just tuning in and this might be the first time that you're tuning in ever or maybe you were like tuning in with us at the beginning of lockdown but now is, you've just started watching again. There are so many ways to be connected to the life of this vision and of this church. But at its absolute core is what we describe as relationship with the one. It's relationship with God our Father, the relationship that is deeply intimate and deeply personal to each and every one of us. And that has been a thing that cannot be taken away from us by face masks or social distancing or anything else. You cannot socially distance the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Love that. We need a handkerchief. Um, and so we have, through the course of lockdown, put together a ton of resources to help us because actually nurturing and cultivating that relationship with the one is a hard task. Just like any relationship is a hard task. And so we have, through the course of lockdown, made the homepage of our website a virtual prayer room. Those of you who are incredibly vigilant and have been on the website will have noticed that that has now moved. It is no longer on the homepage, but it has its own dedicated page on the website. If you just go onto the contents of the website and go under prayer, everything is there to help build and nurture that relationship with God. Um, and, and do make use of that, and we will keep adding to that as the weeks go on. But also another so helpful way to build that relationship is to ask for help, ask for guidance. And our hub pastors are absolute well are an absolute wealth of resource and experience and wisdom and guidance when it comes to actually how do I build my relationship with God? What okay, so I've started to pray, but what do I pray? What do I even say? And if you're not part of a hub and would uh, then go onto our website and you can sign up for any of the hubs, they meet all across the city. Um, do sign up for one. We are so excited to see you in person. And September the 6th is only three weeks away. So close. It is so <laughs> close. September the 6th, everything permitting, so long as national guidance and government guidance doesn't change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we're all quite used to that now just changing it at the drop of a hat, but we're used to it and we appreciate it. If everything stays the same, then on September the 6th, we will be gathering together in person here. Work is underway to make preparation for that. But we really want to see your faces today. And so after the service, we are going to be having another of our post-church Zooms um, where we can all just get on. You can say hi to people, maybe chat to people that you haven't been able to keep in contact with through the course of lockdown. Um, yeah, it's a ton of fun. Amazing. Yeah, so do join us. We look forward to seeing your face. Um, so now is just our opportunity, um, before we hear from Francis Chan um, and Nikki Gumbel, it's just our opportunity to give back to God what he has given to us. It's a moment in the service where just to maybe um, spend a moment in prayer, asking God um, what he's calling you to give. Um, it might be um, to Trinity, it might be to something else, but just spend this moment um, to ask God where he is calling you out in generosity. Um, so Jesus, we just pray, Lord, you are the generous God. You've given us so many things. And we receive all your good gifts and we want to pour them back in service to you. So I pray you would stir your church right across this city into the posture of generosity. And we pray you would multiply everything that this church has for the city, for the sake of your people. Amen. Amen. 
So we're going to have our interview now with Francis Chan. Um, as John said earlier, Nicky Gumbel is, is interviewing him. Um, it's part of we, over August, we've had this opportunity to hear from a few different people who are following Jesus all across the world. And it's a real, um, it's a real joy. It was, we heard from Bob Goff last week. If you didn't catch that, go back and have a listen. He was amazing. Um, so we're hearing from Francis Chan today, um, a pastor over, well, he was in America. I think he's now moved, but we'll hear more of his story um, now. So check this out. I'm here with Francis Chan, who is, I think, first thing to say is a friend. He's been, he spoke here a few years ago and gave an, an, an unforgettable talk at HTB. And then we had lunch with him and some of his family. I've been such an admirer of Francis Chan's preaching, his ministry, his, his writing Crazy Love, of course, is a book which has sold, I don't know how many, but I suspect millions of copies around the world. And uh, I don't want to waste any more time with the introduction because I want you to hear from him. So, Francis, just tell us, tell us about your, because you had the most extraordinary background growing up. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I love it. Uh, you know, my, uh, my mom died giving birth to me. My dad remarried and then my stepmother died when I was eight. My dad remarried again and then uh, he died when I was 12. And so burying my parents obviously has a huge effect on you as a, as a little boy. And, and just the thoughts of, man, I've got to take this seriously. What happens when I die? And just got very, very serious about knowing that. You know, so while everyone else is having fun, playing, whatever, I'm thinking about eternity. Because I, I, when you bury your, your dad, that's, that's all you can think about, at least for me. And yet it caused me to seek after God. And when I found Jesus and really fell in love with him, then my, my biggest concern was all my friends and sharing the gospel with all of my friends and, you know, cutting class and telling my friends about Jesus. Because I'm thinking, we're talking about eternity. Like, What age were you and how did that happen? I think I fell in love with Jesus in around 15, 16. Hmm. And... And then just by sharing the gospel with all of my friends and not really wanting to do anything else, that's when I just felt like God was saying, do this with your life. And I talked to my youth pastor about it. And, uh, and we both just felt like, yeah, this is my calling. So I was about 18. Did you have a Christian background? There was some. I mean, my, my parents were believers, but it wasn't anything we ever talked about in the house. And... They, their first language is Chinese. And so there was just a real lack of communication, plus a terrible relationship with my dad to where we never even had a conversation. So it wasn't until after his death that uh, I really understood the gospel. Oh, amazing. And, then, and now you have the most, because I've met some of them, the most amazing family, amazing wife. And yes. she'll just say a little bit about, about that. Because that's such yeah. a contrast from your own family. Totally. I mean, I, I we have seven children. My wife and I have been married for 26 years. And I mean, our 25-year anniversary last year, she looks at me at dinner and goes, do you know anyone on earth happier than we are? Hmm. She goes, anyone that's more blessed than we are. And she goes, I keep thinking there's got to be someone out there that's as blessed as we are. She goes, but I, I've never met them. And I go, I feel the same way. Like, even, even when Lisa and I decided to move out here and take the, you know, the younger kids with us, our two married daughters and our son-in-laws, they fasted and prayed and individually came to us and said, we feel like God's calling us to go too. And so now there's 12 of us out here, like they, they live like two blocks from me. And, and it's like, my wife and I were in tears, like, who gets to do this? It's just everyone serving together. And we just love being together. Like, it's just so fun. I, I'm, I can't even believe it. And uh, uh, the title of your book, Crazy Love, needs no explanation when, when you hear you speaking about your love for Jesus, your love for your wife, your love for your children. Just say a bit more about because that book has, has such an impact. Does, what, what, what's the heart behind Crazy Love? The heart was, okay, once I got into the church and I'm studying the Bible, it, it had such an effect on me. Like I'm going, wait a second, God is like that? 
No one ever told me he was like that. Like how holy, how huge, like, like I, we can't even look at him. He's so beyond us. And then that being, you're telling me he sacrificed for me, his son. Like, this is insane. It, 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 my whole life should revolve around this. I should have an insane response to that. And yet I'd look around the church and everyone's just kind of, <laughs> hearing another sermon and i'm going are you are you reading is, is, is my bible the same bible you're reading because this is freaking me out right now this is everything to me and and so for so much of my christian life i was kind of calmed down like hey you know like you'll you know it's the honeymoon phase it's this it's that you don't have to be so serious and i'm going no this seems very serious to me and that's when I just felt like I need to write about this because I bet you there's other people like me that yeah. just feel like, man, I should devote everything to this. And you became a pastor and you built like a mega church, huge church, thousands of people um, in your church. And, and many people think, oh, that's the dream, you know, be a pastor, mega <laughs> church. But you, you built all that and you said, no, actually, now I'm going to do something totally different I, i'm I, I i see something different and i want to do something different just explain why why did you decide that 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 was not the model for you to have you know one person and thousands yeah. of people? well it was really the elders that spoke to me it was some of the the professors at our bible college that were speaking to me some of the students that were talking to me and as we searched the word we saw Man, God calls for a deep, deep, intense love. He says, like, like Nick, if you and I are in a church together, I'm supposed to be one with you just as the Father and Son are one. I go, are you kidding me? Could you and I really be that close? And yet that's his prayer for us. And I'm thinking, we're nowhere near. That, that hasn't even been a goal for us to be that perfectly one and all of the one another's in scripture and then the power of the Holy Spirit in every person's life. I'm going, I, I need everyone exercising their gift. I, I, I want this love between each other. I want this multiplication of, of leaders. We're all supposed to be disciple makers. And I realized everything was centered around me and I, I just thought we've, we've got to change that. So that was the idea of me, many more, just like small groups and people meeting in, in much smaller groups. Yeah, I, I think part of it was when I went, I had always heard about the underground church in China, yeah. but then to actually visit and see these believers that were so on fire that, that felt like they walked right out of the New Testament, meeting these believers in India, same thing, they just, I, and yet, they multiply to millions of people without a big name speaker. It was about everyone sharing the gospel. You know, a lot of what you emphasize in Alpha, it was just, just like everyone should be doing this. And But then it went beyond that to, to discipleship and planting these house churches. And, and I just saw the way they work together. And I just go, okay, this is what we need for the future. I also heard you speak about your your trip to Myanmar um, mm -hmm. and the impact that had on on you know the, what we read in the New Testament. We read in the New Testament yeah. all these amazing Book of Acts, healing, yeah. miracles, yeah. and we all believe yeah. that. But then, uh, where do we see that? Um, and uh, it's often on the front line that yeah. people see it. Just say just say about your experience. Totally. And you've seen it for years, but for me, I've believed it could happen. And then I started pursuing it, but I still didn't ever, I, I never saw it. And it wasn't until I was really desperate. I mean, here I am in a village that has never heard of Jesus, never, never heard the gospel and have been indoctrinated in another faith for their entire lives. And I'm going to come along and I get this one opportunity to tell them who Jesus is. And I was just trying to put myself in their shoes and go, how could I ever believe that kind of message unless there was just a power that night that I had never seen my entire life. And I begged God for that. And after sharing the gospel, we called people to come forward um, for prayer and everyone I prayed for was healed. 
And I, I mean, I had to be the most excited guy in the room. And people were believing in Jesus and wanting more of Jesus. How many people were at the gathering? And, and how many people were you praying for? And how were you praying for them? There was probably, there were two different gatherings. In the village, I would guess there were like 200 people okay. in this upper room of the elders, you know, uh, you know, um, gathering hall. I guess it's kind of his house too, but they're just cramming in. And it, it uh, I mean, there were people just saying, I have this crazy pain in my back, you know, I'd lay hands and it would be gone on oh, my knee. I haven't been able to stand up. Uh, you know, boom, it's gone. I mean, I've prayed these prayers many times and nothing happens. Um, the most dramatic for me, I mean, there was another deaf girl that a couple of our friends prayed for, um, her and her brother, you know, deaf from birth, you know, that could hear now. And, but the most dramatic was this lady that came up, just her eye was swollen and so much pain in her head. She said, you hardly think. And it's all through a translator. So I prayed and she says, yes, the pain's completely gone. And she goes, but can you take away the swelling? And I'm like, I'll give it a shot. You know? <laughs> and I pray and it like went down like halfway. And my translator looks at me and goes, does it look like it's halfway? I go, I think so. I go, let's keep praying. And so I did it again. And he looks at her and he goes, I don't know if you see what I see, but I don't see any swelling anymore. I go, I don't either. This, like, this is, uh, it's just so fun. I just thought, I want to live this every night of my life. I, I want to see God work like this. Yeah. Um, and that night, there were probably 2,000 people at that gathering. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And what was the impact you think on, on that on that village? I mean, did the in terms of faith and Jesus. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there are people now that are being discipled. Um, the, the the lady that got us in there, she got there through just helping them dig wells, and you know, she bought some land from this or that. That's why they allowed this message to even come in. So she's still working with them people are being discipled you gave a talk uh, i don't know how long ago it was the title is lukewarm and loving it and i guess it's kind of the opposite of crazy love lukewarm and loving it uh, but anyway my daughter and um, a friend of hers listened to it and it had such a profound impact on their lives and i'm sure they must be one of probably hundreds of thousands of people who've listened to that talk but just say a little bit about um, lukewarm and loving it. My concern was reading that passage in uh, Revelation 2 and, and uh, or Revelation, uh, the, the church in Laodicea, I forget if it's two or three. But uh, just going, wait a second. He's saying uh, you, you're, you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, naked, blind, and he says, I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to repent or I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And he goes, you're not hot, you're not cold. And, and, and I just heard so many Christians kind of go, yeah, I'm lukewarm, I'm lukewarm. And I'm going, that doesn't make sense. Like, if you're lukewarm, you're going to be spit out of the mouth of God. And, and people are going to say, well, I'm a lukewarm Christian. And I'm going... I don't think there's such thing because he's saying if you're lukewarm, you're spit out of your mouth. You're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. Those are not terms he uses for his children. People were just too happy calling themselves lukewarm and thinking like there was a safety in that. And I'm going that I was telling you, like, you shouldn't go to work tomorrow. You shouldn't do anything until you have this figured out. So. Yeah, sorry for hey, me preaching. Okay, thing. okay. So, Francis, supposing someone's watching this right now, mm. and they're saying, "Yeah, that's me," and I don't, that's not how I want to be. Um, I want to be like Francis. I want to be like Francis. Like, I want to be filled with that love. Uh, mm. Will you? Will you pray for them right now? Will you? Will you? Will you lead them in a prayer? Lead them in yes. a way that they can say to the Lord, Lord. Yes, and I. Father, I just pray for anyone right now God who really doesn't know you, that you would pour your grace out right now because you're the only one that can do it. You're the only one who can open eyes. Please, God, 
Show them how quick this life ends. Show them your beauty, your glory. Like, gosh, to be loved by you, protected by you for all of eternity. May they see the worth of a God who would give his only son to die for our sins. Would you open their eyes to, to your greatness that they would want you as their king and want to be a part of this kingdom? Oh, God, would your Holy Spirit open eyes right now? And if that's you, just tell God, Lord, I see your beauty right now, and I don't want to lead my own life. I want you to lead me. I'll walk away from anything to be one with you. I want your spirit in me. Come into me now and change the rest of the time I have on this earth until I see your face. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, Francis, thank you so much. Uh, your words are, are so powerful. and prayer was so powerful and a huge privilege for us to have you with us, uh, both both at HGV and to all the other churches that are joining us today. Uh, on behalf of them all, I want to say just massive thank you to you. Thank you so, so much. Amazing. Well, you might want to um, just stay in this moment for a little while if you really feel like um, God is moving and God is speaking to you. Don't miss the moment. Don't move on um, to the next thing. Um, just maybe take this moment before I read in to pray. Um, you might want to just jot something down um, if something stood out to you. Um, it's, it's also our moment to share the peace with each other. We've been doing this over lockdown, um, sending a text to someone in this time that you've just been thinking about and you want to just say hi to, you want to say um, send your love to. So why don't you do that um, in this uh, next minute or so and then Favor's going to come and read to us. So with thee beside me, I shall never stray. Father, let this be my prayer to follow you alone. Father, let this be my prayer until you Amen. I'm reading from Luke, uh, verse 38 to 39. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from an eye fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent her, he bent her over and rebuked the fever, and he left her. She got up at once and began, and began to wait on them. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Thank you, Favour. It's not often you get to follow um, St. Francis Cham. So I think it would be best for all of us if we begin by praying. Should we pray together? Lord Jesus, you are so good. And I pray, God, that my words today would be pleasing to you. God, that they would uh, serve you and they would serve your people. 
Amen. Amen. Well, good morning again. Um, it's great to have you with us. Uh, everyone survived the tech problems, which is amazing, and hopefully you can hear me now. When I was a, a teenager, my teenage years, I spent a lot of time playing in bands. That's right, I was cool. And one of my favorite things, my favorite things about playing in bands was the moment immediately after you had played a great gig. You know, one of the gigs where you're on stage and you just know that things are going right, which for a lot of the early bands I was in meant like hitting roughly 70% of the right notes and not playing too badly out of time. But there were those gigs that, that, that everything sort of just clicked. You know, you had prepared, the sound engineer was on form. There were more than six people in the venue and they were singing along and there was a vibe and it was amazing. There was an atmosphere, excitement. Yes, yes, yes. And you knew after this set that a wave, at least I did, a wave of affirmation and, and minor celebrity and all the rest of it was just waiting to hit you when you went down into the crowd. It's this moment that I loved. And so I'd go down and I'd pick a spot in the room and if you're anything like me, which hopefully you weren't, you know, I'd, 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 uh, I'd, I'd sort of pretend to like maybe pack something up so I didn't look too needy. And people would kind of come over to me and treat me like I was a little bit famous. Oh my gosh, that was so good. You guys are amazing. You should be playing Glastonbury. That song where that thing happened was great. And then I would like deliberately try to act a little bit sheepish and sort of underplay it. And like, oh, wow, that's so kind. And, you know, that, oh, that song, oh, we, we wrote that last week. We only practiced it like once. So uh, it's, it's whatever. Uh, by the way, do you want to buy t-shirts that we can get home later on? <laughs> Some laughter in the room. Hilarity. Some people in the room have been in bands just like that, I think. As we um, continue in the Gospel of Luke today, we see Jesus emerging from a truly, not an actually life-changing performance. Not a song performed with guitars or drum sets, but a miracle performed with the authority and the power of God. As we saw last week, Jesus had freed a man with an impure spirit. And unsurprisingly, everyone that was around him and saw this was amazed and Jesus' fame continues to spread. We see uh, the passage just before this, that reports about Jesus went out to every place, every place in the surrounding region. You know, this was a proper post-performance moment. And yet, unlike me, at those gigs as a teenager, Jesus wasn't standing by the door of the synagogue waiting to just desperately to lap up the affirmation and the compliments to cement his kind of increasing celebrity, wanting to squeeze all the hype and excitement out of the moment. Jesus doesn't do that at all because he's fixated. He's fixated on, he's, he's driven by something so much greater and so much bigger than ego. He's fixed on serving his father. Jesus is fixated on doing the will of his Father in heaven. And he's totally secure, knowing that he is God's beloved, that he's God's Messiah, that, that the Spirit of God is upon him, that to call you and me, to call all of creation home to God. And so Jesus, focused as he was on serving his Father, leaves the visibility and excitement of the synagogue and enters the privacy and familiarity of a house. Simon Peter's house. Honestly, this challenges me so much. In a, in, a, in a culture that is fixated on status and celebrity, on being seen and noticed, on, on being validated by what we do or the amount of followers we have or the influence we might have on Instagram. In the face of a celebrity moment like this, Jesus turns away to be a servant. You might put it like this. In a world convinced that authority is about status. Jesus shows us that true authority is about service. And if we want to carry Jesus' authority, which we've been looking at over the, the past couple of weeks, as we'll continue to look at next week, if we want to carry this authority as Jesus follows, we need to become like him. This needs to be our, our disposition, that our greatest pleasure is to do the will of our Father in heaven. That what drives us, what animates us every day is to serve God and to serve people. This has to be our driving force. This has to be our true north. If we want the authority of Jesus, as Joe said earlier, we have to become like him. 
And so in serving God's will, Jesus finds himself in our passage there at Peter's house. And we read that Peter, Simon Peter, I think, in, in the NIV, we read that his mother-in-law has a high fever, a sickness that was worrying to all of those that were present, and they were asking Jesus to heal her. And so in a moment, just like you expect with Jesus at this point, you, know, you almost don't want to get used to it, but you kind of expect that when Jesus turns up, something amazing is going to happen. But of course, Jesus touches her and in a moment heals her. But what I want to really look at today is um, what happens next. Because what happens next is also remarkable. We read that, that Peter's mother-in-law, after being touched by Jesus, after being healed of her fever, immediately rose and began to serve them. Immediately, straight away, Luke makes a point of saying, straight after this happened, immediately she began to serve Jesus and those in the house. You know, I, I, even after a miraculous healing, I would expect there to be a couple of moments to sort of just chill in bed and kind of try and take in what had happened. Maybe send your son-in-law, Simon, to get you a cup of tea or, or, or maybe journal a bit about it. Try and wrap your head around what had just happened. But the immediate response that she has to the life that God gives her is to serve. Let me say that again. Her immediate response to the life God's give her, God gives her is to serve. You know, it was like, it was like, a, it's like an instinct, right? It's like she knew that no other response would be appropriate. The word serve here in the Greek means to, 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 to serve literally, as in, as, as in to wait upon but also to minister to. It's like her instinct was to minister to Jesus after meeting with him. She couldn't do anything else. This encounter with Jesus turns her outwards. She's freed from any self-obsession, any sense of this moment being about her, that she would hoard it, that it was just for her benefit. And she has turned outwards in service to others. She becomes like Jesus. That's what happens. She is touched like Jesus and she becomes like Jesus. Because Jesus, as we've already said, is the king who came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus, who washes the feet of his disciples, who takes on the form of a servant for our sake, and who serves us even to the point of death that we would have a life in all its fullness. When Jesus touches her, she becomes like him. And this is what, what, what Jesus offers for each and every one of us. It makes me think of two stories in particular to illustrate that. The first is of a friend of mine who's a barber in Nottingham. And I first met this guy when I was with a member of our congregation. And we went into his barber shop as part of prayer on the streets to see if he wanted prayer uh, for anything. It, it became clear very quickly uh, that he knew Jesus. And he really began to just disciple us and just tell us about Jesus and teach us about his goodness. But he shared with us his story and um, the, the country that he grew up in, he was a very well-known kickboxer. And he, he was super involved in that whole culture. And there was a lot of money invested in the fights that he was doing. During this time, he encountered Jesus. And he felt Jesus say to him very clearly that he wanted him to use his fists not to harm, but to serve. And so... Obviously, when Jesus says something that clearly in your life, you retrain as a barber and move your whole family to Nottingham. And that's exactly what he did. Loving Jesus, now serving the city with his hands. The second story that comes to mind is the story of Maximilian Colby. The Anglican Church, um, just this past Friday, remembered the life of Maximilian. And maybe if you've attended Alpha or you've led on Alpha or you've had anything to do with Alpha, you've heard this story before. Maximilian Kolbe was a Polish priest and friar who pioneered um, amazing things in his life, not least uh, publication and Christian zines and, um, and Christian broadcasting. But he's most remembered for an incident that occurred after the, breakout, out, after the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. Kolbe was sent to Auschwitz concentration camp and one morning, to punish a failed escape attempt in the camp, the Nazis chose 10 men at random to die in a starvation bunker. One of the men selected to die was Francis Gajniewczyk. And when he was selected, he cried out, Oh, my poor wife and children, they'll never see me again. And at that point, Colby stepped out and said, 
look, I'm a Catholic priest. I don't have a wife and children. He said, I want to offer to die instead of this man. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. And apparently during his time in the starvation bunker, Colby got everyone praying and singing hymns and completely transformed the atmosphere in that place. Eventually, Colby was um, uh, put to death by lethal injection in August 1941. These clearly are two different stories. But at the core of them is the same event. Both men have been touched by Jesus. And their response was to become like him, to live a life outwards, to serve God and to serve others, even to the point of death. For Peter's mother-in-law, it looks simply for her like serving those in front of her, serving those in her immediate vicinity. You know, when I, when I hear about these stories, I find myself <laughs> inspired and challenged. But the truth is that we simply need to meet with God to live this way. You know, when it, when it comes to service, by the way, none of us are neutral. You know, maybe you're watching this and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian or you're joining because a friend's been nagging you for the last couple of months. You know, it, when it comes to service, none of us are neutral. All of us serve something. All of us serve a vision of life that we think will ultimately fulfill us. You know, you know many of us will serve, serve money or position. Maybe we serve pleasure or security or family. The difference is, and, and the claim of the Gospels is, it's only in serving God. It's only in serving God and extending his love out to those around us that we find life in all its fullness, that we find the life that we're longing for. You know, Peter doesn't um, heal, uh, sorry, Jesus doesn't heal Simon Peter's mother-in-law because of her CV. You know, we don't hear that she's the most religious or the most holy or the most charitable, but it's just his desire to meet with her. It's his desire to touch her, to bring healing to her, to transform her life. You know, and I, um, I, in watching that Francis Chan interview, I cannot tell you how many times this week I've had that on repeat, just being inspired over and over again. But it's so easy for me to, 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 leave, to leave something like that. I feel like I have to conjure this passion up. Like somehow I've got to engineer um, being more excited about God. But the gospel tells us very, very clearly that it's only in meeting with Jesus, it's only encountering God, it's only in, but by being filled with his spirit, by his pure grace, that we can live a life for him. We can't conjure this up. You know, for me at the moment, you know, I look at, I look at what it means to serve. I look at what it, what it might mean for me to really prefer others to myself, to really outdo others in showing honour. To really celebrate other people's stuff, even if they're succeeding when I'm failing. And my only response is this, that I have to pray every single morning, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I do not have a chance of following your will. I do not have a chance of serving your people unless I'm filled with you. Jesus, I need a living encounter with you every moment. I give my heart to you again today. I need you. Only by becoming like you can I live the life that you call me to live. And so, no points for guessing this. The response is always the same. Here at Trinity, come Holy Spirit. We need to meet with Jesus. It's, it's, it's when Simon Peter's mother meets with Jesus. It's when she is touched by Jesus that she's able to live a life outside of herself, that she's able to live a life fixated on God's will, fixated on serving him and others. Why don't we pray? Maybe if you're at home and you want this, perhaps you've been stirred by um, what Francis Chan was sharing earlier as well. Why don't you just open your hands and we're really just going to simply ask for God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. That's what we're asking for. When we're asking God to fill us with his Spirit, what we're saying is, Holy Spirit, show me Jesus. Show me Jesus again. I need a vision of Jesus which is greater than any other vision in my life. So Holy Spirit, I pray would you come now and I pray that you would fill every hungry heart. Lord, every single person, Lord, who is, who is in this moment asking for more of you, who in this moment is empty um, um, to be filled with you, Lord, I pray would you meet with them by your Holy Spirit now. 
Thank you that this is all a work of your grace, Lord. We can't earn your love. We don't serve to earn your love. We serve, Lord, because your love meets with us in Jesus. And so, Lord, I just pray now, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come? Would you fill living rooms, bedrooms, Lord, wherever people are congregating, across the city, across this country, Lord Jesus? Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you reveal Jesus? Come, Lord, reveal the King. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Father. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. And for some, some of us, it's, it's almost as if, you know, we, we, we just have to lay down in this moment. It, it, you know, we, we've, we've tried to find authority on our own terms. We've, we've sought authority in the wrong things. And Jesus in this moment is just saying, it, your authority comes from knowing me, from doing the will of, um, of the Father. And also in this moment, just to, just to offer, offer him that. You know, Lord, forgive me when I've tried to find life outside of you. Lord, forgive me when I've thought authority comes from anyone other than you. If you're anything like me, your prayer might just be to say to Jesus, crucify my ego, Lord. Lord, I don't want to be known. I don't need to be significant. I just want to be yours. Come, Holy Spirit. do feel for someone I just think there's um, uh, I, think, I do think there's a man watching and as I shared that story about uh, my, my friend the barber <laughs> and God calling him out of um, that lifestyle that he was in and into doing something else I do feel like God may be even prompting you that strongly today that you know there's just ways and patterns of living in your life that aren't God's best for you and you know that he's been nudging you for a while now to, to leave that behind. And Lord, I just pray in your grace and in your kindness, would you, would you just speak to that person now? Would you just quiet any voice that um, has created an unnecessary attachment to that? And Lord, I pray for your life to just come and fill their body now. We're going to respond, continue to respond in worshipping together. But it's so simple. It's so simple. Even as we worship now, just ask him, Jesus, come. Thank you that you want to meet with me. Just, Just open yourself to him. Ask him into your life. Ask him to touch your heart, to heal your soul. Amen. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could
could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory To wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, I am forgiven the King of kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever Jesus Christ, my living hope Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared that death Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your buried body Begin to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. draw our time together um, to close in just a second but just before we do just as George was going through the response I was just drawn back to that picture of the good shepherd that Joe read out at the beginning of the service and and actually the sense that I had was uh, and that we had was that there's somebody who you've been watching this service and actually it's as if you're sitting on the fence it's like you're looking in and maybe this is actually a looking into accepting Jesus at all, accepting Christianity. And it's like you're looking in, but you're not quite sure. And, and just the sense that we had is that Jesus is looking at you as the good shepherd and he's smiling and there's love in his eyes and he's just beckoning you in. He's just drawing you in and saying, now is the time. Now is the time. Just come in. And he's looking towards you with love. And so I just pray, Holy Spirit, for whoever that is this morning who's sitting on the fence. Lord, you know all the reasons why we sit on the fence. Why we want to keep you at at a distance. Why we feel afraid of going fully in. But I pray now, Holy Spirit, for bravery and courage. And I pray for a clarity of your face and of your smile and of the joy in your eyes. For that person, Lord, that they would come in that they would receive all the goodness that you have for them. 
that they would receive your kindness, that they would find out that you are kinder than they ever dreamed that, that you could be. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for joining us this morning. It's been great to be together, albeit virtually. Um, do join us for our post-church Zoom. Um, in a couple of minutes, we'll be jumping on. Um, so follow um, the Meet an Ideal link um, and... Um, It'd be great to see you in a few minutes. But let me pray a prayer of blessing over us before we go. So the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. See you next week. Take care. Or soon. On Zoom. God.